Today we're going to start out with a quote by the Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw who said the single biggest problem in communication was the illusion that it has taken place. Now this quote is perfect for setting up a discussion about the communication process. Just because you're having a conversation with someone doesn't mean that communication is actually happening. So today we're going to take a look at the reason why by covering the definition of communication, the process of communication, and the types of communication. Let's start out with the definition of communication. It's always a great way to define things so we can understand what we're dealing with. Randy Fugison is the author of The Natural Speaker, which is the textbook that I didn't require you guys to buy. And he defines communication as the process of sending and receiving messages. Now that makes sense, right? If we're having two people talking, one is sending a message and the other is receiving it. If we had to draw a picture of this, it would look something like this. So here you can see we have our two entities, our two little stick figures of the sender and the receiver. Now the sender has something that they want to say, a message, an idea in their brain. But in order to get it out of their brain, they have to encode that message into words. They then send that message over to the receiver, who hears all of those words, takes all that in, and they decode that message, meaning they create meaning from those words. Now, the receiver is also going to give that sender some feedback. So they are going to encode their feedback, both verbally and non-verbally, and send that back there across over to the sender. And they're going to obviously keep encoding and decoding messages back and forth. Now I want to look at five principles of communication that can help us understand what exactly it is. So first of all, you cannot not communicate. You are constantly communicating something to the people around you, whether you realize it or not. For example, if you were sitting in the back of a classroom, you may not say a word that entire class period, but you are still sending messages to the instructor. Now let's take that a step further. Let's pretend you're not even in the classroom. Your absence could potentially be sending some messages to the instructor as well. So literally, you cannot not communicate. The second principle is that communication is irreversible. Once it's out there, it's out there. Once you send that text message, once you post on Twitter, once you say something out loud to a family member or friend, that communication is out there. It's kind of like that saying, we can forgive, but we can never forget. That's sort of what this principle is talking about. Let's say, for example, you blow up at somebody at work and you really hurt their feelings. Well, you could obviously apologize and you can communicate to repair that relationship, but that initial communication is still sitting out there. The third principle is that communication is learned. A lot of people think that just because we can talk means we can communicate, and that's really not the case. Communication is a much deeper and more richer process than just simply talking. And because communication is learned, we can improve. We can learn how to do it more effectively. Likewise, communication is also cross-cultural, meaning there are certain behaviors that are similar across different cultures, but there's also some that are very different across different cultures. For example, eye contact is a really important thing in the United States in communicating with people non-verbally. However, there are other cultures where eye contact is seen as a sign of disrespect. And the last principle is that communication is a process. So it is a process that has a lot of different variables and moving parts that work together. And sometimes that process works and understanding is created. Other times that process breaks down and that's where miscommunication can happen. So we can understand what communication is, but how does it work? That leads us to the process of communication. Starting with Ogden and Richard's triangle of meaning. Two communication scholars, Ogden and Richards, they came up with these three variables that are occurring during communication. The interpreter, the symbol, and the referent. Now the interpreter is just the speaker or the listener. A symbol is something that we attach meaning to, like a word. And a referent is the meaning that we assign to that symbol. So let's take a look at an example. If you assign me HTD as the interpreter and you give me the symbol of the word dog, the referent for me is very positive. 
I have two dogs, Brooks and Layla. You can see them right there. They're so precious. And they are my little fur babies. So the referent or the meaning of the symbol dog for me is very positive. Now, let's take a look at where this gets tricky. If we take that interpreter and we change it to my dad and we keep the same symbol of the word dog, it changes the referent for him. For him, it's a very negative referent. He thinks of dog poop and the ongoing war he has with his neighbor's dog crapping in his yard. He also is not a dog person. He can't stand my dogs. He thinks that they shed everywhere and that they're annoying. And so the referent for him is a very negative meaning. So you can see that the symbol did not change. The symbol stayed the same. But the referent changed depending on the interpreter. So the referent is always going to depend on who the interpreter is. Along with that, I want to talk about three types of noise. Now, when I talk about noise in this class, I'm not talking about sound noise. I'm talking about distractions that can take away from the communication. And there are three types of noise that can take away from our interactions with one another. The first is actual physical noise. Now, physical noise are distractions that occur in the actual physical environment. So this can be a lot of things. If you are in a classroom, for example, the setup of that room, the lighting, the sounds that may be going on out in the hallway, all of that could be very distracting. But it goes just beyond sound. It's visual things that can be distracting, such as posters on the wall, or maybe it's very hot in that room and the temperature can be a distraction. Even time of day can be a physical noise as well. Certain times of the day, it's easier to pay attention than others. Next, you have physiological noise. And physiological noise are distractions in the bodies of the communicators, the bodies of the speaker and the listener. So if you have a headache, it can be really hard to speak in front of an audience. Or if you're really tired, it can be really hard to listen. Or if you're hungry, or if you, even if you have to use the bathroom, all of that can be a distraction from the communication and an example of physiological noise. Lastly, we have psychological noise. And psychological noise are distractions in the minds of the communicators. And so if you have to work later on that day and you're sitting in my classroom and you're thinking of all the things that you have to do, that is an example of psychological noise. Or if you are thinking about a fight that you had with somebody the night before and you're still worried about it, it's still on your mind, that can take away from the communication as well. Now think about these three types of noise, physical, distractions in the environment, physiological, distractions in the body, and psychological, distractions in the mind. Can you really control all of these? Not really. These are, there are a lot of variables that you simply have no control over. Like for example, I can't control whether or not you guys got enough sleep the night before, or I can't control the things that are going on in your life. But I can think ahead and plan ahead for these types of situations and adjust my presentation and my communication based off of that. So if we take Ogden and Richard's triangle of meaning, if we take that definition of encoding and decoding messages, and we take all these types of noise and we try to make a big model of it, this is what we would come up with, the communication elements model. So you see here we still have our speaker and our listener. The speaker has a message that they want to get across, so they first encode that message both verbally and non-verbally, and they send that message across the channel to the listener. Now the channel is that outer pink circle that you see kind of wrapping up the entire model. The channel is just the way that the message is being sent, what type of medium you're using to communicate, such as face-to-face -face communication, or text, or email, or social media, or TV, or whatever it may be. So the listener receives that message and then they decode it and then they encode their feedback and send that back across the channel to the speaker. And so we keep going back and forth, back and forth, encoding and decoding messages. In their center area there we see the environment. So the environment is a very detailed description of the speaking situation. That includes the physical environment, the time of day, the type of occasion, whether it's formal or informal, and you really start to analyze the situation where this communication is taking place. And then lastly, we have these three lightning bolts to represent the three types of noise. 
So we see now how difficult our job is as a communicator. Now we want to switch gears and look at the different types of communication so that we can figure out some strategies to combat this. And there are five basic levels of communication. The first level is intrapersonal communication. And intrapersonal communication is with just one person, just yourself. Next, we have interpersonal communication. And interpersonal communication is with two people. The third level is group communication. And group communication is with three or more people, but you are communicating towards some type of common goal. The fourth level is public communication. Public communication is when you have a speaker or maybe a couple of speakers and they are communicating to an audience. And lastly, there's mass communication. Mass communication is when you have a speaker or a couple of speakers and they're communicating to a huge wide audience, but they're doing it through some type of medium like say TV or radio or newspaper or even social media and the internet. So we've taken a look at the definition of communication, what actually it is, this process of sending and receiving or encoding and decoding messages. We've also taken a look at the process of communication and all the variables that come into play with the Ogden Richards Triangle of Meaning and the types of noise and how that fits into the communication elements model. And lastly, we identified the types of communication. And in the future, we're going to look at st specific strategies that are going to be appropriate for some types over other types. And so because of all this, we can see how easy it is for that communication process to break down. So like George Bernard Shaw was saying, sometimes we think we're communicating, but it's all just an illusion.